The Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius by George Long Part 1 It has been said that the Stoic philosophy first showed its real value when it passed from Greece to Rome. The doctrines of Zeno and his successors were well suited to the gravity and practical good sense of the Romans. And even in the Republican period we have an example of a man, Amicato Eudicensis, who lived the life of a Stoic and died consistently with the opinions which he professed. He was a man, says Cicero, who embraced the Stoic philosophy from conviction. Not for the purpose of vain discussion, as most did, but in order to make his life conformable to the Stoic precepts. In the wretched times from the death of Augustus to the murder of Domitian, there was nothing but the Stoic philosophy which could console and support the followers of the old religion under imperial tyranny and amidst universal corruption. There were even then noble minds that could dare and endure, sustained by a good conscience and an elevated idea of the purposes of man's existence. Such were Paetus Thraci, Helvidius Priscus, Cornutus, C. Musonius Rufus, and the poets Persius and Juvenal, whose energetic language and manly thoughts may be as instructive to us now as they might have been to their contemporaries. Persius died under Nero's bloody reign. But Juvenal had the good fortune to survive the tyrant Domitian and to see the better times of Nerva, Trajan, and Hadrian. His best precepts are derived from the Stoic school, and they are enforced in his finest verses by the unrivaled vigor of the Latin language. The best two expounders of the later Stoical philosophy were a Greek slave and a Roman emperor. Epictetus, a Phrygian Greek, was brought to Rome, we know not how, but he was there the slave and afterwards the freedman of an unworthy master, Epaphroditus by name, himself a freedman and a favorite of Nero. Epictetus may have been a hearer of C. Musonius Rufus, while he was still a slave, but he could hardly have been a teacher before he was made free. He was one of the philosophers whom Domitian's order banished from Rome. He retired to Nicopolis in Epirus, and he may have died there. Like other great teachers he wrote nothing, and we are indebted to his grateful pupil Arian for what we have of Epictetus' discourses. Arian wrote eight books of the discourses of Epictetus, of which only four remain and some fragments. We have also from Arian's hand the small Enchiridion or manual of the chief precepts of Epictetus. This is a valuable commentary on the Enchiridion by Simplicius, who lived in the time of the Emperor Justinian. Antoninus in his first book, in which he gratefully commemorates his obligations to his teachers, says that he was made acquainted by Junius Rusticus with the discourses of Epictetus, whom he mentions also in other passages. Indeed, the doctrines of Epictetus and Antoninus are the same, and Epictetus is the best authority for the explanation of the philosophical language of Antoninus and the exposition of his opinions. But the method of the two philosophers is entirely different. Epictetus addressed himself to his hearers in a continuous discourse and in a familiar and simple manner. Antoninus wrote down his reflections for his own use only, in short, unconnected paragraphs, which are often obscure. The Stoics made three divisions of philosophy, physic, ethic, and logic. This division, we are told by Diogenes, was made by Zeno of Sidium, the founder of the Stoic sect, and by Chrysippus. But these philosophers placed the three divisions in the following order, logic, physic, ethic. It appears, however, that this division was made before Zeno's time, and acknowledged by Plato, as Cicero remarks. 
Logic is not synonymous with our term logic in the narrower sense of that word. Cleanthes, a Stoic, subdivided the three divisions and made six, dialectic and rhetoric, comprised in logic. Ethic and politic. Physic and theology. This division was merely for practical use, for all philosophy is one. Even among the earliest Stoics logic, or dialectic, does not occupy the same place as in Plato, it is considered only as an instrument which is to be used for the other divisions of philosophy. An exposition of the earlier Stoic doctrines and of their modifications would require a volume. My object is to explain only the opinions of Antoninus, so far as they can be collected from his book. According to the subdivision of Cleanthes, physic and theology go together, or the study of the nature of things, and the study of the nature of the deity, so far as man can understand the deity, and of his government of the universe. This division or subdivision is not formally adopted by Antoninus, for, as already observed, there is no method in his book. But it is virtually contained in it. Cleanthes also connects ethic and politic, or the study of the principles of morals and the study of the constitution of civil society. And undoubtedly, he did well in subdividing ethic into two parts. Ethic in the narrower sense and politic. For though the two are intimately connected, they are also very distinct, and many questions can only be properly discussed by carefully observing the distinction. Antoninus does not treat a politic. His subject is ethic, and ethic in its practical application to his own conduct in life as a man and as a governor. His ethic is founded on his doctrines about man's nature, the universal nature, and the relation of every man to everything else. It is therefore intimately and inseparably connected with physic, or the nature of things, and with theology, or the nature of the deity. He advises us to examine well all the impressions on our minds and to form a right judgment of them, to make just conclusions, and to inquire into the meanings of words, and so far to apply dialectic. But he has no attempt at any exposition of dialectic, and his philosophy is in substance purely moral and practical. He says, constantly and, if it be possible, on the occasion of every impression on the soul, apply to it the principles of physic, of ethic, and of dialectic which is only another way of telling us to examine the impression in every possible way. In another passage he says, to the aids which have been mentioned, let this one still be added, make for thyself a definition or description of the object which is presented to thee, so as to see distinctly what kind of a thing it is in its substance, in its nudity, in its complete entirety, and tell thyself its proper name, and the names of the things of which it has been compounded, and into which it will be resolved. Such an examination implies a use of dialectic, which Antoninus accordingly employed as a means toward establishing his physical, theological, and ethical principles. There are several expositions of the physical, theological, and ethical principles, which are contained in the work of Antoninus. And more expositions than I have read. Ritter, after explaining the doctrines of Epictetus, treats very briefly and insufficiently those of Antoninus. But he refers to a short essay, in which the work is done better. There is also an essay on the philosophical principles of M. Aurelius Antoninus by J. M. Schultz, placed at the end of his German translation of Antoninus. With the assistance of these two useful essays and his own diligent study, a man may form a sufficient notion of the principles of Antoninus. But he will find it more difficult to expound them to others.
Besides the want of arrangement in the original and of connection among the numerous paragraphs, the corruption of the text, the obscurity of the language and the style, and sometimes perhaps the confusion in the writer's own ideas, besides all this, there is occasionally an apparent contradiction in the emperor's thoughts, as if his principles were sometimes unsettled, as if doubt sometimes clouded his mind. A man who leads a life of tranquility and reflection, who is not disturbed at home and meddles not with the affairs of the world, may keep his mind at ease and his thoughts in one even course. But such a man has not been tried. All his ethical philosophy and his passive virtue might turn out to be idle words, if he were once exposed to the rude realities of human existence. Fine thoughts and moral dissertations from men who have not worked and suffered may be read, but they will be forgotten. No religion, no ethical philosophy is worth anything, if the teacher has not lived the life of an apostle and been ready to die the death of a martyr. Not in passivity but in activity lie the evil and the good of the rational social animal, just as his virtue and his vice lie not in passivity but in activity. The Emperor Antoninus was a practical moralist. From his youth he followed a laborious discipline, and though his high station placed him above all want or the fear of it, he lived as frugally and temperately as the poorest philosopher. Epictetus wanted little, and it seems that he always had the little that he wanted and he was content with it, as he had been with his servile station. But Antoninus, after his accession to the empire, sat on an uneasy seat. He had the administration of an empire which extended from the Euphrates to the Atlantic, from the cold mountains of Scotland to the hot sands of Africa. And we may imagine, though we cannot know it by experience, what must be the trials, the troubles, the anxiety, and the sorrows of him who has the world's business on his hands with the wish to do the best that he can, and the certain knowledge that he can do very little of the good which he wishes. In the midst of war, pestilence, conspiracy, general corruption, and with the weight of so unwieldy an empire upon him, we may easily comprehend that Antoninus often had need of all his fortitude to support him. The best and the bravest men have moments of doubt and of weakness. But if they are the best and the bravest, they rise again from their depression by recurring to first principles, as Antoninus does. The emperor says that life is smoke, a vapor, and St. James in his epistle is of the same mind. That the world is full of envious, jealous, malignant people, and a man might be well content to get out of it. He has doubts, perhaps sometimes even about that, to which he holds most firmly. There are only a few passages of this kind, but they are evidence of the struggles, which even the noblest of the sons of men had to maintain against the hard realities of his daily life. A poor remark it is which I have seen somewhere, and made in a disparaging way, that the emperor's reflections show that he had need of consolation and comfort in life and even to prepare him to meet his death. True that he did need comfort and support, and we see how he found it. He constantly recurs to his fundamental principle that the universe is wisely ordered, that every man is a part of it and must conform to that order which he cannot change, that whatever the deity has done is good, that all mankind are a man's brethren, that he must love and cherish them and try to make them better, even those who would do him harm. This is his conclusion, what then is that which is able to conduct a man? One thing, and only one, philosophy. But this consists in keeping the divinity within a man free from violence and unharmed, superior to pains and pleasures, doing nothing without a purpose nor yet falsely and with hypocrisy, not feeling the need of another man's doing or not doing anything. And besides, accepting all that happens and all that is allotted, as coming from thence, wherever it is, from whence he himself came. 
and finally waiting for death with a cheerful mind as being nothing else than a dissolution of the elements of which every living being is compounded. But if there is no harm to the elements themselves in each continually changing into another, why should a man have any apprehension about the change and dissolution of all the elements himself? For it is according to nature. And nothing is evil that is according to nature. The physic of Antoninus is the knowledge of the nature of the universe, of its government, and of the relation of man's nature to both. He names the universe, the universal substance, and he adds that reason governs the universe. He also uses the terms universal nature or nature of the universe. He calls the universe the one and all, which we name cosmos or order. If he ever seems to use these general terms as significant of the all, of all that man can in any way concede to exist, he still on other occasions plainly distinguishes between matter, material things, and cause, origin, reason. This is conformable to Zeno's doctrine that there are two original principles of all things, that which acts and that which is acted upon. That which is acted on is the formless matter, that which acts is the reason, God, who is eternal and operates through all matter, and produces all things. So Antoninus speaks of the reason which pervades all substance, and through all time by fixed periods administers the universe. God is eternal, and matter is eternal. It is God who gives form to matter, but he is not said to have created matter. According to this view, which is as old as Anaxagoras, God and matter exist independently, but God governs matter. This doctrine is simply the expression of the fact of the existence both of matter and of God. The Stoics did not perplex themselves with the insoluble question of the origin and nature of matter. Antoninus also assumes a beginning of things, as we now know them. But his language is sometimes very obscure. I have endeavored to explain the meaning of one difficult passage. Matter consists of elemental parts of which all material objects are made. But nothing is permanent in form. The nature of the universe, according to Antoninus' expression, loves nothing so much as to change the things which are, and to make new things like them. For everything that exists is in a manner the seed of that which will be. But thou art thinking only of seeds which are cast into the earth or into a womb, but this is a very vulgar notion. All things then are in a constant flux and change. Some things are dissolved into the elements, others come in their places. And so the whole universe continues ever young and perfect. Antoninus has some obscure expressions about what he calls seminal principles. He opposes them to the Epicurean atoms, and consequently his seminal principles are not material atoms which wander about at hazard, and combine nobody knows how. In one passage, he speaks of living principles, souls after the dissolution of their bodies being received into the seminal principle of the universe. Schultz thinks that by seminal principles Antoninus means the relations of the various elemental principles, which relations are determined by the deity and by which alone the production of organized beings is possible. This may be the meaning. But if it is, nothing of any value can be derived from it. Antoninus often uses the word nature and we must attempt to fix its meaning. The simple etymological sense of fusis is production, the birth of what we call things. The Romans use natura, which also means birth originally. But neither the Greeks nor the Romans stuck to this simple meaning, nor do we. Antoninus says, whether the universe is a concourse of atoms or nature is a system, let this first be established, 
that I am a part of the whole which is governed by nature. Here it might seem as if nature were personified and viewed as an active, efficient power. As something which, it not independent of the deity, acts by a power which is given to it by the deity. Such, if I understand the expression right, is the way in which the word nature is often used now, though it is plain that many writers use the word without fixing any exact meaning to it. It is the same with the expression laws of nature, which some writers may use in an intelligible sense, but others as clearly use in no definite sense at all. There is no meaning in this word nature, except that which Bishop Butler assigns to it, when he says, the only distinct meaning of that word natural is stated, fixed, or settled. Since what is natural as much requires and presupposes an intelligent agent to render it so, i.e., to affect it continually or at stated times, as what is supernatural or miraculous does to affect it at once. This is Plato's meaning when he says that God holds the beginning and end and middle of all that exists, and proceeds straight on his course, making a circuit according to nature. And he is continually accompanied by justice, who punishes those who deviate from the divine law, that is, from the order or course which God observes. When we look at the motions of the planets, the action of what we call gravitation, the elemental combination of unorganized bodies and their resolution, the production of plants and of living bodies, their generation, growth, and their dissolution, which we call their death, we observe a regular sequence of phenomena, which within the limits of experience present and past, so far as we know the past, is fixed and invariable. But if this is not so, if the order and sequence of phenomena, as known to us, are subject to change in the course of an infinite progression, and such change is conceivable, we have not discovered, nor shall we ever discover, the whole of the order and sequence of phenomena, in which sequence there may be involved according to its very nature, that is, according to its fixed order, some variation of what we now call the order or nature of things. It is also conceivable that such changes have taken place, changes in the order of things, as we are compelled by the imperfection of language to call them, but which are no changes. And further, it is certain that our knowledge of the true sequence of all actual phenomena, as for instance the phenomena of generation, growth, and dissolution, is and ever must be imperfect. We do not fare much better when we speak of causes and effects than when we speak of nature. For the practical purposes of life, we may use the terms cause and effect conveniently, and we may fix a distinct meaning to them, distinct enough at least to prevent all misunderstanding. But the case is different when we speak of causes and effects as of things. All that we know is phenomena, as the Greeks called them, or appearances which follow one another in a regular order, as we conceive it, so that if some one phenomenon should fail in the series, we can see that there must either be an interruption of the series, or that something else will appear after the phenomenon which has failed to appear, and will occupy the vacant place. And so the series in its progression may be modified or totally changed. Cause and effect then mean nothing in the sequence of natural phenomena beyond what I have said. And the real cause, or the transcendent cause, as some would call it, of each successive phenomenon is in that which is the cause of all things which are, which have been, and which will be forever. Thus the word creation may have a real sense if we consider it as the first, if we can conceive a first, in the present order of natural phenomena. But in the vulgar sense a creation of all things at a certain time, followed by a quiescence of the first cause and an abandonment of all sequences of phenomena to the laws of nature, or to the other words that people may use, is absolutely absurd. Now, though there is great difficulty in understanding all the passages of Antoninus, in which he speaks of nature, of the changes of things and of the economy of the universe, 
I am convinced that his sense of nature and natural is the same as that which I have stated. And as he was a man who knew how to use words in a clear way and with strict consistency, we ought to assume, even if his meaning in some passages is doubtful, that his view of nature was in harmony with his fixed belief in the all-pervading, ever-present, and ever-active energy of God.